Hi, I'm Tim, welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. It is the weekend, and we are starting the weekend with watches. Everything you see here is for sale. Names, references, and prices in the description below where possible. Reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com to buy, trade, or sell. And of course, if you are looking to sell, we are looking to buy single watches and full collections, no upper limit on value. Reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Starting right off with a watch that stole my heart back in 2007, the return of the classical Rolex Milgauss for the first time since 1988. It returned with a little bit of a postmodern flair to it, an array of colors and some designs that were, to say the least, eye-catching in the stolid and sober Rolex catalog but look more closely and you realize that even the lightning bolt seconds hand is derived from the mid-1950s original. They could crack a smile back in the 50s. The watch does include a broad array of colors, a matte black dial, orange accents, including the three indices at three, six, and nine. Of course, the shock of orange with the name, the numerals, the hand, and the green tinted crystal, the GV. This is the 116 400 glass vert, 40 millimeters in diameter. As ever, it is a rugged, full-service sports watch with a soft iron inner cage for magnetic shielding. It's actually paramagnetic. It bends the field lines around the escapement. The escapement in this version is anti-magnetic, and the hairspring is an anti-magnetic niobium zirconium alloy. So my guess is that this watch is quite a bit more than mil or 1,000 gauss. I suspect this watch is in fact far more because the niobium zirconium alloy is the same material IWC used in the Ingenieur 500,000 ampere per meter and up. And remember, mil gauss is 80,000 ampere per meter. I suspect this watch may be multiples of mil gauss. And on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the watch, which is automatic, chronometer certified, and 100 meters water resistant, looks perfect. There's your down the barrel, there's your cuff shot, and there's your direct overhead. Want to do a loom shot? Well, it's a Rolex sports watch, so why not? As you can see, Rolex chromolite blue we're going to return to the light, but first, can you guess what's coming next? We'll see how sharp you are. Did you guess right? This was a 2016 addition to the Blanc Pain 50 Fathoms lineup, part of the Bathyscaphe series that launched in 2013. This is the 43.6 millimeter ceramic blue dial Reference 5,000, five-day power reserve, 300 meters water resistant. The bathyscaphe has always been a little bit of a more classically styled 50 fathoms. As you can see, the sheer and thin case band, minimal beveling, squared out lug ends, and the no guard big crown profile inherited from 1950s and early 1960s 50 fathoms model. This is in contrast to the more conventional 5015. Now the watch is more wearable as it's smaller than the 5015. It's also thinner at 14 millimeters thick. And in ceramic, it's both nearly impossible to scratch and very light. Easy to wear on the wrist, extremely comfortable. The combination of the blue and the gray of the ceramic is absolutely stunning and the depth has a lustrous metallic sunburst fashion that sets it apart from the more reserved dial of the 5015. Now they have the same movement inside. Caliber 1315, I'm gonna clean off the sapphire so you can see it is artisanally finished. So it has three mainspring barrels a five-day power reserve, a free-sprung balance, and an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. You can also see that the bevels are a mile wide, and that's my favorite feature of this movement. It truly looks decadent and luxurious. The appearance is unconventional with the blackened gold rotor, and as you can see, there is a sort of spiral graining that's drawn across the across the bridges rather than a more conventional Cote de Genève. You'll also appreciate that this movement features satin finish on the wheels, the bevels are a mile wide, I just can't believe it. The quality of black polish on the screws is as good as anything else in the Valet du Jeu, and it is adjusted in six positions, not a standard chronometer like five. Now taking a quick look at something that resets all expectations for finishing quality, other than one-man brands along the lines of Marco Lang or Kerry Voudelainen or Philippe Dufour, Hajime Aseoka, the brands regarded as the finest in finishing are companies like Grubel Forcy and Romain Gautier, even Laurent Ferrier. That ilk represented here in the tourbillon 
Vantket Secon 24 second tourbillon. And you can see it's angled at 25 degrees inside its pillar style and black polished tourbillon structure. The tourbillon carriage is angled, the overcoil is hand fashioned, and the balance is free sprung and adjusted in six positions. You can appreciate it from any angle. It makes a full rotation every 24 seconds. The combination of the overcoil, the six position adjustment, the 25 degree inclination, and the speed of rotation, helping this tourbillon carriage to reclaim the original chronometric purpose of Abraham Louis Breguet's famed tourbillon regulator, evening out the effect of gravity on the rate of timing. Now the watch is 43.5 millimeters in diameter in white gold, which actually makes it one of the more compact Grubel 4C watches. It has a three-day power reserve in spite of the manic tourbillon, and you can see there's a power reserve indicator with a freehand engraved gold scale that's then filled with lacquer. Turning the watch over, the case designs of Grubel 4C, which are guided by Robert Grubel's aesthetic sense, they really don't get as much recognition as they should, but you can see how complex they are with the welded lug profile, the satin finish on the flank, the black polish on the lug, and the lugs themselves almost concave in their profile when viewed from head on. Turn the watch over and you can see the watch is classical, whereas the front is avant-garde, the rear could have been born of the 18th century, as there's a great deal of pocket watch imagery here. We have the Maichot, or nickel copper zinc bridges, known as German silver in German-speaking regions. You'll also appreciate the jewels set in golden chaton, as they would have been during the pocket watch era, and a Grubel 4C signature, the use of absolutely colossal fire-blued heat-tempered screws. If you take a quick look, you can also see many interior angles are visible, and this watch simply runneth over with fine finish. You can even see, if you look very closely, that the spokes of the wheels themselves have been beveled, so absolutely no detail overlooked. Now, this is a large watch. It has a movement to match as the caliber is over nine millimeters thick for your viewing pleasure, and over 36 millimeters in diameter, so it is properly sized to fit the case. Can you wear this watch on a small wrist? You better believe you can. I would even say down to 15 centimeter circumference, you can wear this white gold beauty with absolute security on the wrist. Now a watch that represents probably the best new timepiece of 2010. This is a watch that I can only describe as the world's most sophisticated alarm timepiece. It is the Senator Diary, 42 millimeters in stainless steel from La Suta Original. It is a fully loomed, automatic winding, sports style calendar alarm. So you can actually set, and I'm gonna get close here so you can see the details. You can set the watch to sound off at any one of 24 hours of the day, on any day up to 31 days in advance, which means at the day and time of your choosing, and it can distinguish between AM and PM, the day and time of your choosing, the watch will sound off. You can set this watch weeks in advance, and if you make changes to the time and the date in the calendar, the watch will make corresponding calculations for the alarm. As you can see, there is alarm off, there is the setting mode for the day, the setting mode for the hour, and then the alarm active. All of this with a flyback system. There's a pusher on the side that uses a chronograph-like flyback action to reset the seconds hand. Now turn the watch over, and my favorite feature is the alarm, but also the display case back, as this is the Caliber 100, Glossuta Original's flagship automatic movement of the 2010s. You can see the two barrels, 55 hour power reserve, and an extraordinary 86 joules adjusted in five positions. You can see it is a combination of hand, I'm gonna do my best here, hand and machine finish, a grade comparable to what you'll get with Audemars Piguet, and that is high praise. A truly special watch and a wonderful one to wear. I'll throw it on my wrist. It has a lovely set of short cropped and tightly downturned lugs that mean it wears comfortably on a smaller wrist. It is low enough to fit underneath the cuff and it is supremely useful. It's also well loomed, so we're gonna do a loom shot of this one. You can see there is nothing the Senator Diary cannot do. Roger Dubuis, 
increasingly being discussed as a rival to both Richard Mille and Grubel Forsey, it sort of combines the attitudes and values as well as aesthetic sensibilities of the two manufacturers. Now, of course, Roger Dubuis is more of a manufacturer than Richard Mille has ever been, as since the early 2000s, they've been able to make their own cases, movements, hairsprings, balances, and escapements. And all of that is what you see here on this Roger Dubuis Excalibur Spider Skeleton Flying Torbjorn. Now, this is a 2018 release. As you can see, the case is made all of carbon fiber, and on the reverse side, a limited edition of 88 pieces. Throw the watch on the wrist, and though it measures approximately 45 millimeters at the case, you can see it's feather light, and it's nicely shaped as it drapes itself over the wrist, and the down the barrel shot makes it clear that the size is big, the look is bombastic, and it's no coincidence that Roger Dubuis is allied with Lamborghini and Pirelli in the marketing stakes, as this watch is very much of a Lamborghini sensibility. Now, because it is a flying tourbillon, there is no upper bridge to block your view of the tourbillon regulator. You'll also note that in spite of the avant-garde materials used, this is a Poisson de Genève or Geneva Hallmark movement. You can see it's stamped adjacent to the keyless works. Because of the skeletonization of the movement and the dial, you can actually see the keyless works in action and you can see the motion works, which drives the hands in action. It's a manual wind timepiece with a nice chunky classical beat rate and a chug like a pocket watch on the wrist. What I also enjoy is that new for that year, there was the introduction of the quick release strap. So you can easily remove the strap from the carbon case if you want to change the look or you simply want to clean more closely between the lugs. A truly special piece and an awesome modern day sports watch proposition. Everything is immaculately, albeit very unconventionally finished in this watch. This is high horology avant-garde. Now, jumping into a timepiece that I think was probably one of the best new watches of 2010, along with the Senator Diary, this is the hugely overlooked Ulysse Nordin El Toro GMT Plus Minus Perpetual, a 43mm ceramic and platinum limited edition of 500 pieces. It is a chronometer. It is a dual time. It is fully loomed. It is a perpetual calendar. It is 100 meters water resistant. It is platinum and ceramic. It is built with a rubber strap and a deployant clasp, so when you throw this watch on your wrist, and it is best for those who are large of wrist, it has impressive presence. It's a sports watch through and through, and again, on the rubber strap, you can dive right into the water with this perpetual calendar GMT. The ultimate travel watch with Cote de Genève laid down on the dial side. The finishing is extravagant. The look is distinctive. It will not be mistaken for anything else. And with a combination of useful, practical features and chronometer refinement, it has both brains and beauty. Now we're gonna take a look at the dial and I'm gonna demonstrate some of the features of the Ludwig Oxlin Perpetual Calendar System. First, let me get the hands out of the way. The fun thing about the Oxlin system is that it is bi-directionally adjustable. So you can actually adjust the calendar in both directions. And you can see how I'm varying the date between October and September you can adjust the calendar in both directions. One of the few perpetual calendars that can do this, and it was the first. You'll also note that it is a comprehensive perpetual calendar that's easily read, as you have apertures for the day, the month, the date, and of course, the year. It features two digits for the year and the decade. COSC Swiss chronometer, you can see the watch is fully loomed, and it is the GMT plus minus perpetual, which means you have a useful 24 hour format second time zone, and the plus minus triggers, which feature ceramic, for scratch resistance, allow you to quickly adjust your time zone of the moment. So that is the local time, and that will handle adjustment of the date forward or backward as you travel. The ceramic cap on the bezel prevents scratching, actually acting as a heat shield for the watch, and you can see the movement, which includes a handsome nickel anthracite coating, is built by Ulysse Nordin, distantly based on a Le Mania caliber. It uses a magic lever bi-directional winding system, and is quite handsomely executed and distinctively executed with a combination of the rustication inside the recesses of the rotor, the nickel anthracite coating, and the circular rather than linear Cote de Genève across the bridges. A very cool piece and an all-around example of outstanding engineering and innovative design. You can see right down to the use of a welded lug profile with the lug built separately and then welded on. This is an artisanally built watch of the highest order that happens to include a mechanism that is user friendly to the highest degree. We'll do a loom shot too because it is a sports watch. 
And there we're back with the El Toro GMT Plus Minus Perpetual. Plenty of loom and wonderful depth to the dial. Here's a watch that could do double duty as your sports watch or your dress watch. This is the Brigade Type 20, the 3800BR. This is the Aero Naval because it does not include a date on the dial. 39 millimeters at the bezel. The watch is a rich red gold with a blue dial. And if you look quite closely, you can see this example is vintage from the 1990s as it includes a true tritium fade. That is not Fotina, folks. That is the real thing. This watch is as authentic as it gets. Now, connoisseurs understand that several brands, there were a big four in particular, built the Type 20 to the French military contract Type 20. That was the name of the contract. The Type 20 as we know it today comes from the company that built and serviced these watches for the longest period of time through the middle 20th century, and that is Breguet. The watch obviously is a luxury article as it's finished to a degree that no French military era naval issued watch ever was. Naval aviators in France never knew such gorgeous coining of the case or black polishing of the lugs. They never enjoyed a dial with this degree of detail, gloss, and luster, nor did they ever enjoy a movement as refined as the caliber 582 inside, as this is based on the 1970s era, Le Magne 1350, meaning it's one of the finest cam chronographs ever made. It is a flyback standard. It has a 48-hour automatic winding power reserve. It is both very accurate and tank tough, and as you can see, this this watch is full service, above the waves or below, 100 meters water resistant. It features a screw down crown. It features an aviator style bi-directional timing bezel that you can use as an ancillary timing device. You can time two concurrent events, one with the chronograph and one with the bezel. It includes a full red gold deploying clasp and on the wrist, the fact that it is only about 45 millimeters lug to lug means it is supremely wearable on a smaller wrist. It has immense presence, class charm and an enduring appeal that transcends its era. This watch may have been built in the 1990s in homage to a watch designed during the 1950s, but darned if it doesn't appear as attractive as ever, perhaps even more so today in 2020. Speaking of the 1950s, that is the era from whence the Cartier Roadster, launched 2002, draws its immediate inspiration. When you look at the dial, in particular, of this Roadster Large, you get a sense of where the imagery came from. Jaguar, Porsche, Mercedes-Benz dashboard instruments, clocks, tachymeters, and speedometers. And that is where this multicolor radially arrayed, slightly retro dial draws its primary inspiration. Now you can see a combination of black, white, green, and red with a lovely bit of automotive character festooning the case. You have the case screws Frenched, as you would have seen on an early 1950s American hot rod. You have Dagmar Overrider style crown. And of course, you have a little bit of a blend of that Overrider into the magnifier of the date. The watch is gorgeous, flowing, organic, sculptural, and more than any other Cartier model out of production, I hear calls for the resurrection of the Roadster. Not from the traditional Cartier watch clientele of women, but from men who absolutely worship this watch and all of its smart references. The timepiece, being only 10.9 millimeters thick, is slender. 100 meters water resistant, it's swimmable. Automatic winding, it's versatile. And fully loomed, it's visible. Throw it on the wrist, the comfort is outstanding. It's about 52 millimeters from lug to lug, about 37 millimeters across the case, not including the crown. And then if we just count the actual case lugs itself, it's about 52 millimeters from end link to end link. The case is about 44 millimeters across the wrist. I'd recommend you think of it as approximately a 41 millimeter round watch. It wears like that. But you can see I have absolutely no difficulty wearing the watch on my wrist. Supremely comfortable, nicely curved, and equipped with a system that would later go on to feature on 
IWC watches. It's a quick release system for the bracelet. So just like that, you can remove and replace the straps or the bracelet. This is especially useful if you wish to swap between them. It's powered by an ETA2892A2 base, which means it is both tough and very accurate. This is the Cartier Roadster to own if you can only own one of them. The resurrection may happen, but this is the original and the best model, emphatically, amongst the original models. Let's divert for a moment to Geneva and Patek Philippe. We're going to turn back the clock to 1998 when the Patek Philippe 5059 Retrograde Perpetual Calendar launched. A fascinating fusion of an aperture-style perpetual calendar with a retrograde date. It also incorporated the Patek Philippe Officer's Watch motif, whereby the case, as well as the dial, are designed to emulate those early 20th century trench watches created for officers in the First World War almost always by converting an existing pocket watch to a wristwatch. This would involve taking a pocket watch, and you can see the resemblance in the shape of the case, welding on lugs, and indeed you can see this is true welded lug construction, and then fixing bars for the strap using a screw fixture on each side. You can also see elements such as the traditional pocket watch onion crown and the use of a hunter case back which would have been along for the ride during the conversion of the pocket watch to a wrist watch. So you have that officer's watch look here in 36 millimeters, Patek Philippe 315 Q caliber, QRS, and of course you can see on my wrist it has more presence than a typical 36 because the lugs are so strong and straight. They're prominent and they're broad, but you can still wear this watch on a 13 centimeter circumference wrist. The dial is no nonsense, high contrast, perpetual calendar, retrograde, and moon phase. And of course, the look from any angle is elegant. It's a sporty watch to be sure, but it's also a dress watch first and foremost, which means it wears well with almost any office attire. Quickly jumping back to caliber 315, you can see a few of the features that are endemic to this model. I'm going to get close and do my best to show you that it does feature the Ponson de Genève as all models in the 5059 range were built between 1998 and 2007 prior to the use of the Patek Philippe seal in 2009. So you have mirrored bevels, rich coat de Genève, you have engine turning not just on the base plate but you'll also note on the little click reduction wheel adjacent to the rotor and there's engine turning at the center of the rotor as well. The detailing is outstanding and all of the screws are hand finished with chamfered slots as well as circumference and all of the screws screw and jewel sinks are polished in the same fashion as the beveled edges. It is a truly impressive watch inside and out, and I just love the intuitive nature of the dial, which is super simple to read, apertures for the day, the month, the leap year phase, and then the retrograde date, with the romance of a moon phase tossed in. But not everyone is into precious metal. If that's the case, you don't want to go 36 millimeters, you don't want to go precious metal because after all it scratches, but you still want a heaping helping of complications. That's exactly what you get in this 2010 Panerai Luminor 1950 GMT 10 days PAM 335 from the Ceramica series, 44 millimeters with a Luminor 1950 case. This is the case that's more directly inspired by the actual locking crown Panerai reference 6152 of the 1950s. It's a little bit more sculptural in its form curved and complex than the tunican-like Betterini case designed by Alessandro Betterini for the original 1993 Panerai Luminor and Marina. This case, again, more interesting to look at, an all-in-black ceramic, virtually indelible, super hard, and among watchmaking materials, really second only to sapphire, it will resist scratches, scuffs, and for the most part, dense. Also, because it cannot be refinished, you know when you buy a pre-owned ceramic watch, it is exactly as it left the factory. So if, like me, you hate scratches and scuffs, swirls and marks, ceramic is for you. There is a lot going on on this dial. Taking a quick look, you can see that it uses a domed and dramatically cambered sapphire that's designed to evoke a vintage Panerai plexiglass, and it does that, right down to the distortion off-axis. You'll note it is a sandwich dial with a stencil on top of a fully loomed disc this is historic Panerai construction, and you have a lot going on on the dial itself. First of all, you can see there's a second time zone that you can hide under the local hour whenever you please. You've got a 10-day power reserve with a power reserve indicator. You've got a date. You've got local time. You've got that second time zone, and coaxial with the second sand, you've got an AM-PM that allows you to discern whether, for example, we are looking at 
three in the morning or three in the afternoon. And you can see that the index is actually pointed at three in the morning. It's in the AM side, two semicircles, this is the AM side, we're looking at 3 AM. Now another feature that's a lot of fun with these watches, if you take a close look, you can see the coaxial seconds hand with the AM PM indicator. When I hack the seconds, you can see there's a zero reset that centers the seconds hand, so you can set this watch precisely to a reference time. The locking lever with Panerai, as ever, remains an absolute piece of theater and a design icon so iconic you know exactly what watch this is just by the crown guard. Flip it over and you have one of those over-engineered debut series Panerai movements from the mid-2000s. A man named Eric Klein was responsible for most of these early Panerai movements and with the manual wind P2000 and automatic P2003, he really, I don't want to say overdid it, but certainly launched Panerai with a flourish into the world of manufacturer watchmaking. This timepiece, with a free sprung ba balance and a full balance bridge, is very shock resistant. With three mainspring barrels and a 10 day power reserve, it's an absolute embarrassment of mechanical refinement. Alongside the zero reset hacking system, the second time zone, and of course the watch still 100 meters water resistant. If you have a rotation of watches, and I have to acknowledge that a big stark black ceramic watch might not be an everyday watch for everyone, well you don't even have to wind this watch every week, it's more like every other week. A spectacular array of complications, a no scratch case, tons of loom and water resistance. This is a put it on and never take it off kind of watch for those who don't mind wearing something that's a little bit boisterous and extreme extravagant and undoubtedly extrovert. This watch is groaning with refinements and we're going to do a loom shot. Luminor by name, Luminor by practice. Of course you can see the zero reset of the seconds hand right there and note that all of the sub-registers are loomed including the power reserve. All right, 69 pieces, 2010, and one of my top three all-time favorite FP Jouer models. This is the minimally signed Vagabondage 2, the second in the cushion case series, or we'll call it what it is, a tonneau case. Uh, the model came out in two versions, red gold 68 pieces, platinum 69 pieces, and while the original Vagabondage 1 of 2005 and 2006 is less common, and the Vagabondage 3 is a little bit more animated with its jumping seconds, the two, to my eye, is the best balanced and the most interesting. It's about 37 millimeters wide, 8 millimeters thick, and 45 millimeters lug to lug, with a rose gold movement and a platinum case. It does have a significant and impressive weight on the wrist, but it is super wearable, slim, compact, elegant, and versatile. This is a unisex option par excellence. Anyone who wants to wear an haute de gamme watch that's not going to overwhelm with its size would do well to pick this model. Now what appears at first glance to be a fairly symmetrical dial is anything but. You can see there's a power reserve at the top, a jump hour, jumping minutes, and then a second subdial. But take a look at the bridges from side to side or I should say the bridge covering the time-telling instruments, it completely asymmetrical. So it's a wonderful little trick of the eye. Now, if you look carefully, you can see through the smoked sapphire, the base movement with the jumping discs underneath. The watch needs to be wound every day at the same time because all of that jumping takes a lot of energy. So it has a 28 hour power reserve, which means you are gonna wind it every day. Now you can see the movement is both shaped for the watch and sized for the watch and made of 18 karat rose gold, an FP Journe house special. It's also free sprung and beats away at 20 16 caliber 1509, meaning that it is 15 French lean in diameter, 09 being the year work started on the movement. That's how an FP Journe movement code works. I'll also flip it back over and remind you that there is no branding on the front because the first Vagabondage used a movement FP Journe designed for Cartier, an unused Cartier Tortue movement. He bought the movement back and ultimately put it in the Vagabondage one, but that one did not meet his standards for precision, so he didn't want to put his name on it. Well, with the Vagabondage 2 and 3, he he met his standards for precision, but he had established a precedent. So all three Vagabondage models only feature the brand name on the reverse side. Of course, the watch features an unusual accessory, a full deployment clasp to match the case. Most Jorn watches use pin buckles only.
a little bit more traditional, but no less imposing. This is the F. Pigeon Chronomet Souverain Black Label. The Black Label is a model that is exclusive to boutique and espace of F. Pigeon, but it is also restricted to those who have previously purchased a new F. Pigeon watch, so it has two degrees of restriction. There's a third. Annually, only two examples of any given model can be produced in the Black Label series. 40 millimeters by only approximately eight millimeters thick. The watch is broad and thin, graceful and glorious as the combination of black dial and platinum case exclusive to this black label watches is probably the most visually imposing and impressive of Jorn color combinations. It is low, it wears well with a cuff, and you can see that the movement caliber 1304 is a bit more elaborate in its layout than what we just saw, the 1509 on the Vagabondage. There are two barrels here, they give it a 56 hour power reserve, but their real purpose is to release a very even stream of torque to the escapement, and the idea being that two barrels make for less variation in amplitude after, for example, 24 hours. So a Rolex will lose quite a bit of amplitude between full wind and 24 hours after full wind because it is a single barrel watch. There's only so much you can do to control the output of torque. With two barrels, you can control the torque output better by varying the torque curves of the two springs. Adjust it in six positions, one more than a standard chronometer, and now you're really onto something. You have a large 18 karat red gold movement, and note the use of a hidden drivetrain as the drivetrain itself Itself actually runs underneath the dial so you can see the barrels you can see the escapement but you can't see the transmission between them that opens up a gulf between the barrels and the balance and that's used for a graining a sort of radial sunburst grain emanating out from under the barrels you also have Cote de Genève perfectly aligned across the bridges and then you have a mirrored beveling on the edge of the bridges and screw and jewel countersinks. Finally, there's an engine turning on the base plate. And being platinum with the rose gold movement again, it's not a big watch, but it does have a significant heft on the wrist. So you feel that the watch has an integrity, a luxury, a decadence to it that belies the simplicity of the dial. As we draw towards our conclusion, I think it's important to note that you don't have to go Crador to own one of the ultimate craft achievements of Grand Seiko. This is part of the limited edition of Kirazuri dials, or shiny painting, an artisanal craft emulated by the rusticated and metallic coated dials of the SBGA 385, 386, and 387, and this is the 20 piece SBGA 385, the most exotic, accurate, and exclusive of the three Kirazuri models. Now you can see the case. It's the 44GS case that's been around since the late 1960s, and it has a lovely combination of curves and flat planes, hard angles and arcs. The facets, especially the upper and lower facets of the case, are black polished. Executing that manual tin plate Zeratsu finish on precious metal is no mean feat. Doing it on platinum is harder still. It takes three years to master this tin plate black polishing that Grand Seiko uses on its cases. And as the 44GS is one of the most emblematic Grand Seiko designs, this watch combines its finest craft art with its most recognizable case and a dial that showcases what we love about Grand Seiko, the willingness to be different and acknowledge regional specialties. The Kirazuri shiny painting, often used in prop work for Kabuki, you can see the pattern itself is deep, sharply ridged, and a little bit rusticated, almost like the texture of a cement wall. You also note that all of the indices in the hands have been manually polished against diamond-tipped milling tools. There are artisans at Grand Seiko who only make these tiny metal sculptures. They're faceted like gems, and they actually break so sharply you could see the difference between the flat plane at the top of the hands and the facets on the sides of the hands. The seconds hand is steel and fire blued, three day power reserve, one of 20 made. And you'll also note that it features a special movement. This is the 9R15 because of the rose gold medallion in the rotor, you know it's tuned to a standard beyond standard spring drive. Standard spring drive is plus or minus 15 seconds a month. Hot rod spring drive, as you see here, is plus or minus 10 seconds a month. Despite being a dress watch and wonderfully wearable at approximately 39 millimeters as I measure it, the watch is 100 meters water resistant, which means there's a versatility here that you wouldn't get in a Patek Calatrava. And spring drive is no mean feat. 
It took from 1977 to 2005 to bring automatic spring drive to market. There are no motors, there are no batteries, there are no capacitors. All of the motion you see is driven by the spring. There is an induced electrical current that is created by this governing wheel driven by the spring. That wakes up the quartz oscillator and the wheel then acts as a brake to slow down the seconds hand in order to time per the orders given to it by the quartz oscillator. And you'll note that because it's a unidirectional governing wheel, the seconds hand sweeps continuously. There are other hands, for example, the bull of a precisionist that appear to sweep, but even that stops and starts. This is the only clean sweep. Piaget has tried to emulate this technology with some degree of success, but we're talking a few dozen watches. Grand Seiko has mastered this technology. We'll throw the watch on my wrist. I should mention there is a deployant clasp on this watch, and it's an unusual clasp in that it uses platinum. It uses platinum 900 and platinum 950, the 900 being used for smaller swing arm components of the clasp because they wanted to make a full platinum clasp without compromising the structural integrity. So this watch clasp is one of the few applications you'll ever see of PT900. The watch wears easily and comfortably, and I can recommend it for even petite wrists of 13 centimeters circumference. Now we discuss my favorite independent, and this is a watch that came out last year. Artisanally hand-finished, five-day power reserve, power reserve indicator, rotating dive-style bezel, 100 meters water resistant, 44 millimeters in titanium, with variable geometry floating lugs. This is the DB28 GS Grand Bleu. It is how de Betun does a dive watch. Now you can see it is hand-finished. Though it is avant-garde in appearance, you have all of the traditional standards, including mirrored beveling on the edge of the bridges. You have black polish, and not just some, but huge expanses of black polished steel, triple parachute shock protection, one shock protection spring, two shock protection spring, and then Inca block over the center for the balance staff, patented shock protection, patented twin self-adjusting barrels, five-day power reserve. You have a patented dog leg kink flat hairspring that is shaped in-house by de Betun that gives you the concentric beating of an overcoil with the shock resistance of a flat hairspring, and then you have a balance wheel made of white gold and blue titanium, also patented. It reduces the reaction to thermal variation, so it has a low coefficient of thermal expansion, and it's aerodynamic, recessing the weights into the rim, as well as maximizing the mass in the rim. This matters. You'll also note there's a black polished mirror underneath to improve your viewing pleasure, and a proprietary silicon escape wheel to reduce friction. Black Badger of James Thompson actually provides the static luminova for this dial, and you'll see it in a moment, but it is the means by which you illuminate this dial that truly makes the model. Being over 100 meters water resistant, you can see the mechanism underpinning the power reserve. It is a true sports watch with a screw down crown, and you can note that this micro light engraving allows a differentiation from conventional watches. No cliché Cote de Genève here. We have a deeply engraved striation all over the visible portions of the movement. We're going to talk a little bit about how the illumination system works. There is a minute repeater style governor that slows down the release of energy from the mainspring barrels to run the LEDs, and now you're going to see them. As you can see, this watch is a unique preposition. You'll note that the system is running with the governor slowing the release of energy. You can see it can actually run for about 30 seconds continuously. And because the bezel is backlit, you have no difficulty viewing the bezel in the dark. Now you can see the small black badger patches of AGT Ultra that are used to illuminate the hands when the system is inactive. And at only 12.9 millimeters thick, this is a never take it off type watch. The lug to lug varies from 51 to 55 millimeters. I can wear it easily, and believe it or not, it will fit underneath the cuff. This is the most exciting new watch of the last two years, in my opinion, from a company that only makes 150 watches a year, with finishing on the level of Laurent Ferrier and engineering on the level of Grubel Forcey. This is a watch that nevertheless combines all of that with a style of its own. They make their own dials, their own cases, their own movements, even shaping their own hairsprings and building their own balances. You get a lot when you buy de Betun. That said, you get more when you buy this de Betun. 
The timepiece you see here launched in 2015 as a 20-piece limited edition. It is the DB25 Tourbillon Zodiac. It has a four to five day power reserve, a power reserve indicator, deadbeat seconds, and a dial inside a 44 millimeter white gold case that includes both rose lathe guilloche at its center and 12 individually hand-carved golden medallions depicting the signs of the Zodiac. Now, each one of these has been hand-carved by Michele Rotin, who is the in-house engraver at Debetun. I mentioned they have technical capability to make all the parts of their watches, but they also have the artistic crafts in-house, which means every single mini medallion you see here in solid gold was hand-carved, laboriously so. Moreover, you can see a blued ring into which the medallions are set. That blued ring is fired titanium that has been fired and tempered blue. This is a patented process that De Batoon owns. You'll also note that there are small white gold cabochon and large white gold indices for the hours. Each one of these little white gold bulbs has been placed by hand and polished by hand. There's a power reserve indicator. The watch will run for between four and five days. It has a deadbeat second system, which is activated by an indirect center seconds mechanism. Note the 14 karat gold escape wheel that's used to meet out those one second bursts of energy to the seconds hand. Below that, and by the way, note the blued titanium bridges, you could see a tourbillon regulator that beats away at an El Primero like 36,000 vibrations per hour. The cage is made of silicon and titanium, and not only does it beat away at 10 beats per second, but it circuits, or it makes one circuit, every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds it rotates as opposed to the conventional 60 seconds that is germane to almost all tourbillon regulators in a wristwatch application. As with the DB28 we just saw, we have a proprietary hairspring, we have a proprietary balance and escape wheel, and you can see that this balance is not identical to the other one we saw. De Batoon has patented over half a dozen balance wheels. You have a silicon escape wheel, again, of a different design specific to this model, and you have a rim made entirely of white gold. All of the mass is in the rim. I told you about the conventional finishing in unconventional forms and you can see it here the bevels are a mile wide and polished to a mirror's shine you can see the screw heads are black polished the slots are chamfered and so are the circumference and take note of the Cote de Genève this is Cote de Betune it is a more deeply shall we say more deeply drawn Cote de Genève so the abrasive wheel is held on with more force, but it's also turned in two different directions. I always say real abrasive wheel Cote de Genève will have a dark side and a light side, and you can see that's the case. One side of these strakes, in each case, lighter than the other. But note that the dark side on the left of the screen appears to be on the left of each stripe, whereas the dark side on the right appears to be on the right side of each stripe, and that's because De Batoon reverses the side, or this, I should say the direction, of the wheel that's used for creating the Cote de Genève. So the abrasive wheel is reversed so that it can create a symmetrical mirror image of Cote de Genève on each side of the movement. So down the middle it is split and the wheel reverses on each side. You've got the two mainspring barrels and again a superb power reserve for a timepiece that includes an unusual number of power intensive applications. Now you can see there is freehand engraving on the exterior gold medallion inside of the crown itself. And again with deadbeat seconds and a 30 second tourbillon beating away at five hertz, the four to five day power reserve is extraordinary. And though this is a 44 millimeter watch, it wears more like a 41 or a 42. The lugs are short, the case is thin, the look is extravagant, and the timepiece is entirely handmade by perhaps the best independent in the business and my personal favorite. Guys, team also with thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. And let me give you a hint. If you're going to buy just one watch from today's show, please make it this one before I buy it myself. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.